Hello, this is the first of two presentations that I'll make on earthquakes and seismic uh, activity and their influences on buildings. In this first presentation, we'll talk about general concepts and how the uh, basic seismicity is assessed. And then in the second follow-up presentation, we'll talk about how to calculate the base shear that a building is subjected to and how to calculate the forces that we've designed for in the building. Let's get started. This material is covered in chapter six of the tally textbook. There's 245 pages that are devoted to it, and it includes quite a bit of information on earthquakes uh, and uh, how they, um, uh, what causes them, what types of faults are uh, 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 at the, the source of uh, uh, ground motions and things of that nature. It's an interesting read, but it is a lot of material. Also note that some of this material is quite dated. There have been a lot of changes to uh, earthquake engineering seismicity over the past uh, 20 years or so. Chapter six of Fenella is denoted, devoted to seismic loads, and that is also a lengthy chapter at 144 pages, but that is more up to date with respect to the specifications and codes. And there are quite a few examples there that will be helpful to you. Within ASCE 7, uh, it's chapters 11 through 23 that deal with seismicity, and uh, that is 163 pages as well. And uh, International Building Code 2018 uh, covers seismic stuff in uh, section 1613. Now, I'm going to be discussing uh, ASCE 7 exclusively here, but you should note that IBC is very, very similar to ASCE 7 when it comes to earthquakes and seismic loads. This slide shows a breakdown of which chapters cover which issues within the context of seismic uh, design. So we'll look a lot at uh, chapter 11 and uh, to some extent at chapter 12. Um, we'll pull a few things out of the later chapters of chapter 20 and uh, we'll leave much of the rest of it alone uh, within the context of our class. Uh, seismic engineering is one that's uh, uh, can be very deep. Uh, so if you're interested in this topic, then uh, we offer a class at the graduate level on structural dynamics, and then a second class at the graduate level on uh, earthquake engineering. And those course numbers are CVE 7088 and 7089. The general mechanism that gets us from an earthquake event to seismic loads on our structure begins when the ground moves or accelerates under a building or structure. The movement is primarily lateral, but sometimes includes vertical components as well. So a lateral movement would induce a base acceleration underneath the structure, and that manifests itself as a base shear, V sub B, as is illustrated here. The forces that result in the structure are thus inertial in nature, and we go back to Newton's law that says that F is equal to MA, force is equal to mass times acceleration. Because of that, the forces that act on a structure technically act wherever the mass is located. Because mass is typically located in or on the floor slabs of the building, we usually say that the forces are lumped at the centers of mass at each floor level and are distributed vertically as is shown here. The seismic loads that we design for are based on four primary components. First, the geographic location. Where on earth are we designing for? Where are the seismically active regions within the U.S. or on, uh, on earth in general? The second is the geologic location. Um, the type of soil that we design our structure on has a very uh, uh, profound importance on uh, the loads that are transferred into the structure. The 1985 Mexico City earthquake is an example of that. The, uh, the earthquake itself wasn't terribly close to the city of uh, Mexico City, but because Mexico City is built on uh, relatively poor soil, it was very destructive for that city. Third quantity is the occupancy, uh, and we're familiar with this from the other loads that we've already discussed, um, occupancy categories one through four. And then the last one is the building type and the performance of that building, uh, both in what is the natural period, uh, natural frequency of the structure, which depends on its mass and stiffness, and how well that structure actually uh, resists or dissipates the energy that's put into it by the earthquake. Okay, so a little bit about seismicity or earthquake engineering. Um, a seismometer is an instrument that records ground motions, um, not just by earthquakes, but from all uh, different types of sources. And this is an example of what a seismometer might look like. This one is probably older. Uh, I think that most of them now record the uh, 
uh, action digitally as opposed to using an analog trace like this. Okay, a seismometer by itself is just a means of measuring ground motions. When you combine that with a timing device, then you end up with a seismograph. The output of a seismograph is a seismogram, and uh, as is shown in the background of this slide, it used to be recorded uh, in analog form on paper or film, but now it's uh, recorded digitally. A seismogram is a plot of the ground displacement as a function of time. Ground, ground displacements uh, occur in all three directions, and they're recorded in all three directions, but as I said earlier, the lateral movements are typically more pronounced than the uh, uh, vertical movements. So this is an example of a seismogram. And you can see here that there are two different types of waves that are recorded, a P wave or a pressure wave. And uh, that's similar to a sound wave in that it moves uh, in line with the direction of movement away from the epicenter of the earthquake. The second type of wave is an S wave or a shear wave, and that moves uh, much more, uh, much like a light wave would or a radio wave. Um, there isn't uh, very much vertical ground motion associated with shear waves, uh, but the shear waves cause most of the damage to the buildings or structures. They tend to cause the ground to move underneath the structure. Now on this slide, you can see a, uh, um, the results of a seismograph. It would be a seismogram at the bottom. The displacement is a function of time. If we take the derivative of displacement, we get velocity. So there's a velocity record for our structure. And if we take uh, the derivative of a velocity, we get acceleration. Um, so the top form is the ground acceleration. The second one is the ground velocity. And then the bottom one is the ground displacement. So you'll note that most of the ground acceleration records are normalized by the acceleration of gravity, g. Earthquakes are often characterized by a magnitude and or an intensity. Magnitude of an earthquake is a measure of the energy that's released during the earthquake, and the intensity is a measure of the earthquake's destructiveness. The Richter scale was developed to assign a single number to quantify the amount of energy that's released during an earthquake, and it's a scale that's based on a logarithm. So a 5.0 magnitude earthquake on the Richter scale is actually 10 times as strong, if you will, as a magnitude 4.0 uh, earthquake is. Magnitude is formally defined as the logarithm of the ratio of the amplitude of the waves measured by a seismograph to an arbitrary small earthquake. The Richter scale was formally defined in 1935 for a particular set of instruments, and that instrument was actually too small to measure large, uh, large earthquakes, so it becomes saturated uh, when you get to a, a strong earthquake, such as something larger than an 8.0. As a result of this, the scale was replaced by the moment magnitude scale in the 1970s, and MMS values are still commonly reported as Richter magnitudes, though, but uh, you'll often see a, an abbreviation M sub W afterwards. For example, if you look up the Mexico City uh, 1985 earthquake, then you'll see that listed as 8.0 uh, M sub W. Earthquake intensity is typically characterized using the modified Mercalli intensity scale, and it's a qualitative measure of the earthquake intensity, not a quantitative one. So there are basically 12 different intensity levels which are described using a rubric, um, and they range from an earthquake that's not felt, uh, an MMI level 1, to one that causes total and complete destruction, which is an MMI level 12. This slide shows a summary of the different uh, 12 different intensity levels that are given on the MMI uh, uh, index. And um, uh, you can see a more uh, exhaustive description if you look in the tally textbook table 6.2, or you could probably find one on uh, any number of different web pages. Okay, the MMI scale is not terribly useful for the design of structures, though, because it's not based on any quantifiable effects uh, due to the ground shaking. It's totally a qualitative measure of the, uh, the earthquake. The dynamic behavior of a structure can be compared to a simple spring mass system like the one shown here. 
So in this system, K is the stiffness of the structure, uh, and delta is the deformation of the structure. And then, of course, we have the mass associated as well. So it's a bit unfortunate that in the spring mass system shown here, the displacement is vertical, um, whereas in our structure, the displacements would be primarily lateral. But uh, nonetheless, the, uh, the behaviors of the two systems are similar to each other. So the force that's developed in the structure F is equal to the stiffness times the displacement. F is equal to K times delta. If we were to uh, displace this mass and then let it go into what we would know as free vibration, then we would see a uh, displacement that looks like this over a function of time. So the vertical axis on this plot is displacement delta and the horizontal axis is time. Now, the, uh, um, the period of the structure is the, uh, basically the time it takes to go from one position through a complete cycle and back to that position again. So we refer to that as the natural period T. And then the natural frequency of vibration is the inverse of the period. So if it takes uh, one second um, to uh, go uh, as a natural period to go from one position through a cycle and back to its position again, then we would say that one over one second or one hertz is the, uh, the natural frequency of vibration. If the period is uh, uh, 10 seconds, then we would say that the natural frequency F is 0.1 hertz. Now, most buildings don't behave like this. Uh, most building structures have some damping in them. Uh, when the building starts to sway back and forth, there's uh, dissipation of energy, uh, drywall cracks, masonry cracks a little bit. You end up with a slippage of some connections. Um, lots of different sources contribute to result in a damped system as opposed to an undamped system. And that damped system is shown there on the right. So we introduce a little, we call it a dash pot, and we introduce a level of damping, and typically you see the variable C associated with that. Now what that does to the response is that it provides an attenuation to the, uh, the free oscillation over time. So as the damping increase, the amount of time that it takes for the structure to stop swaying is reduced. So uh, undamped system shown on the left with its response shown on, uh, at, uh, on uh, above and the, uh, the damped system shown there in the middle with its uh, response shown at the bottom. These types of systems are referred to as single degree of freedom systems, SDOF systems, and that's because there's only one displacement associated with it. Now you could possibly use this type of uh, system to characterize the response of say a water tower or some type of a structure like that. And in this case, the ground would move left and right and the water tower would sway at its top back and forth like an inverted pendulum. But that's not uh, terribly helpful when we're trying to characterize the behavior of buildings. When we look at a building type structure, we tend to see uh, more than just one degree of freedom. Uh, this building right here has uh, one, two, three uh, floor levels plus a roof, so it would have at least four degrees of freedom. And uh, if you consider motion both in the plane of the slide and in and out of the plane of the slide, then there would be an additional four degrees of freedom for eight degrees of freedom total. <laughs> When we look at how to characterize a system like that, we tend to use a spring mass system that includes a series of masses, a series of stiffnesses, and a series of damping dampers. So the system shown on the right would be more characteristic of what you might expect to see for a building like that shown on the left. Now, what's interesting about this is that you have several different stiffnesses that correspond to the stiffnesses of the different stories in the building. You have masses that correspond to the masses at the different levels. And those masses can be different. Those stiffnesses can be different. Um, in fact, for the roof, you typically assume a lower mass than you would have for the different uh, uh, floor levels. And you might end up with one floor being dedicated to storage or maybe a library that would have a higher mass. So um, all of these stiffnesses are relative to each other as well. You don't have the mass of the third floor relative, uh, being indicated relative to the ground level. In fact, the third floor isn't connected directly to the ground level. The third floor is connected directly to the, the, the second floor. And that makes the solution of the problem a bit more challenging. This slide shows an actual response of a structure during an earthquake. This is a 20-story building subjected to 
the uh, Santa Monica earthquake, I think. So the uh, uh, this would be referred to as a time history analysis where we go in and develop an advanced computer model that actually tracks the response of the structure as the ground is moved. Now, this type of uh, analysis is more complicated than what we can get into in this class, and it's probably more complicated than a lot of structures would be designed for outside of the major seismic zones in the U.S. or, or around the world. But it does give an indication of the type of behavior that we're trying to characterize. You can see that the building is swaying back and forth due to the input of a ground acceleration on the structure. Now, the different types of structures that are shown here illustrate the different types of responses. Uh, on the left, you have a relatively rigid structure, one that's relatively short and stiff. Uh, in the middle, you have one that's uh, somewhat in between being rigid and flexible. And then on the right, you have a, a tall skyscraper um, that has uh, a lot of mass to it, uh, has a lot of height. And because it's uh, relatively tall, it doesn't have a whole lot of stiffness. So if we were to examine the natural periods of vibration for these structures, you would have a relatively short period of vibration for the structure on the left and a relatively long period of vibration for the structure on the right. And all three of these uh, structures would behave differently during any given earthquake. So that's why when you go and uh, do a post-earthquake uh, survey of an area, you'll see that certain types of structures tend to uh, exhibit similar types of behaviors. For one given earthquake, you might see that uh, relatively short buildings have been damaged extensively, while tall ones have uh, escaped much damage. And the opposite might be true for a different type of earthquake. So the analysis shown on this slide is similar to the one that we showed two slides ago, except that in this case, I'm plotting the bending moment diagrams for the members in the structure as the structure is subjected to the earthquake. So typically in an analysis, what you would do, or what you would want anyways, is you would want to figure out what the maximum force effects are in each one of the members during the earthquake so that you could design for those force effects. So in this example, you would go in for every column and every beam, and you would figure out what the maximum value of the bending moment was, or the shear force or the axial force, and you would want to design for that. Now, additionally, you would also be looking for perhaps the maximum drift level at the roof of the structure or the relative drift between any two stories within the structure, and you'd want to track that too and compare that to different limits that are in the specifications. So this slide has a relatively busy chart that shows the responses of a number of different structures to the same earthquake. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six different structures that have six different natural periods. On the left, you can see the dark blue trace that represents the response of a relatively stiff structure, or maybe structure with low mass. And on the right, you can see the orange trace that, that shows the response of a relatively flexible structure, or maybe a structure with a relatively high mass. And the um, uh, each of those six different structures responds differently to the same earthquake. And uh, you can see that the response that's being plotted here on the vertical axis is displacement, but it just as easily could be bending moment as we've shown in, in uh, one of the previous slides. Now the black line at the back is basically the peak response for each of the different structures. So you go in and you, you examine structures that have various uh, natural periods. You figure out what the maximum value is in the response of that structure to that earthquake, and that represents one data point on that black line. Now on the next slide, what we're going to do is we're going to plot that black line for a number of different earthquakes. So the chart shown on this slide is similar to the one shown on the previous slide, except here we're just showing the peak responses. So there are three black lines here that each would represent the single black line that we showed on the previous slide, the peak response of, this, of a suite of structures to a single earthquake. So the solid line here represents the El Centro earthquake from California. The uh, dark dashed line represents the Mexico City earthquake. And then we have a third earthquake there shown as well. Another difference is that instead of plotting the, uh, the peak displacement for the structure's responses, we plot the acceleration. So we basically back out the mass and the stiffness of the structure so we have a normalized chart. Now what we can see from um, this is that um, a number of different structures subjected to a number of different earthquakes have a response that can be enveloped or can be characterized like this. So 
all of these different responses tend to uh, be characterized by an initial upward sloping region, a plateau shown here, and then a declining region like this. So what's interesting about this is that if we take this uh, envelope as uh, being typical of most earthquakes, then you can look up your building, figure out what its natural period is going to be, figure out where that's going to occur out here on this axis. Then you can come up here, figure out where that intersects with this envelope, and then you have your base acceleration you would design for. And once you have your base acceleration, you know your structure's mass, so you can figure out what the force is going to be in your structure. Now this is what the uh, response spectrum looks like uh, as is shown in ASCE7 and um, it has this characteristic response. There are four different segments to it. You have uh, at first you have the, uh, the initial slope line here, then you have the plateau region up here, you have the declining region there up to uh, a period of T sub L and then you have the second region out here. So there, uh, all the response spectrums are characterized by those four different regions. And the two independent quantities that we look at are S sub DS and S sub D1. The design acceleration for short period structures, S sub DS, and the design acceleration for one second period structures or long period structures, S sub D1. So the process for defining the design response spectrum is first to determine what the mapped accelerations are for our building location. We look those up, S sub S and S sub 1. And there are two values, S sub S for short period structures and S sub 1 for longer period structures. And uh, the reason that we have two of them is because short period structures tend to be governed by the acceleration of the ground, whereas uh, longer period structures, tall skyscrapers for instance, tend to be governed more by the velocity of the ground motion. Second step is to account for local site conditions, uh, determine what type of soil that we're going to build on. And we have two quantities that we uh, uh, use to characterize that, an F sub A that's applied to the short period acceleration and an F sub V that's applied to the one second uh, uh, acceleration. And you can see that the A and the V, which correspond to acceleration and velocity, uh, tend to uh, um, imply the idea that short period structures uh, are uh, governed by the ground acceleration, whereas longer period structures are, are tend to be governed by ground velocities. Mm -hmm. Then the third step is to uh, provide a, a conversion from the maximum considered earthquakes to the design basis earthquakes, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So when you want to find out what the mapped accelerations are, you have a number of different options. Uh, of course, there are uh, charts available in the ASCE 7 standard, but uh, more often than not, you'll probably go to a website to determine those. You can go to the U.S. Geological Survey's website, usgs.gov, and there's a lot of information there on uh, ground accelerations to design for. Or you can go to the ATC webpage that we've been using for things like wind and uh, snow load. For the United States, what you would find is that uh, the accelerations are shown here as a contour plot. Now, most of you probably recognize that uh, the West Coast is rather active seismically. California, for example, is prone to earthquakes. What you might not have known, though, is that the largest earthquake ever recorded in the United States was uh, in the St. Louis area, the New Madrid Fault. I believe that it was in uh, 1810 and 1812 that the largest earthquake in U.S. history actually occurred there and caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards for a short amount of time. And then there's also uh, a seismically active zone outside of Charleston, South Carolina as well. So that's where the bright spots are here. So this is the uh, ground acceleration for short period structures, S sub S. And this chart here, this contour shows the uh, uh, ground accelerations for the one second period structures, S sub one. If we look at the uh, uh, Eastern United States, you can see that Ohio isn't uh, particularly active seismically. Um, if you look, uh, the S sub S value is 15% of G and the S sub 1 value is 8% of G, or G being the acceleration of gravity. So typically in the Cincinnati area, uh, most of your structures are going to be governed by wind and not seismic, but you might be surprised depending on the type of soil you, uh, you encounter. Uh, 
Moreover, um, somebody working in the Cincinnati area might very well be designing a building that's in a an area that uh, is active seismically. You might design a building in California, for example, or maybe something even in another country. So the accelerations that are mapped uh, are typically based on 5% critical damping. Um, we talked about damping uh, a few slides before. Critical damping is basically the amount of damping that would be required to remove the oscill oscillation of a, a free vibration entirely. Um, you really need a class in structural, dyna in structural dynamics to get into that, uh, but uh, basically it keeps the structure from vibrating almost entirely. The mapped accelerations um, that I showed a few minutes ago and those that are in ASCE 7 are based on the maximum considered earthquake. That's an earthquake that has a 2% probability of exceedance in a 50 year period and would have a mean recurrence interval of about 2,500 years. Now, those earthquakes are too rare for us to design for. Um, it wouldn't make sense to invest in the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, structure, the amount of steel, the amount of concrete, et cetera, to design for an earthquake that uh, has such a low probability of occurrence. Um, so instead we designed for a design basis earthquake or uh, a DBE, which has a 10% probability of exceedance in 50 years uh, or a mean recurrence interval of 475 years. So there's a conversion that's uh, included in there, and you'll see a ratio of two-thirds in uh, one of the upcoming slides. And that, that ratio of two-thirds is basically telling us that our design-level earthquake has a magnitude that is two-thirds of the maximum considered earthquake. So if we ever get a maximum considered earthquake, you could expect that most of the structures are going to be uh, basically lying in piles of rubble on the ground. So when you go and look at uh, the ATC webpage, for example, this is the output you would see. So I uh, determined, I, I told the website that my reference document is ASCE 7, 2016 edition. I said I have a risk category two structure. I even gave it my site classification. We haven't talked about that yet, but this is a uh, site class D, which is stiff soil. And it gave me two different response spectrums. It gave me the one, uh, for uh, horizontal response spectrum, and then it gave me uh, uh, the design response spectrum. So the MCE is shown on the left, and the uh, uh, design uh, DBE is shown on the right. Okay, and then it gave me uh, points off of the chart there shown on the left as well. NEHRP is a group that was active back in the 1990s and early 2000s and helped define the seismic design criteria that we use nowadays. NEHRP is an acronym that stands for the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program. And it basically defined uh, the level of performance that was expected of buildings due to different earthquakes. So we have three different lines, uh, one uh, showing performance group one buildings, performance group two buildings, performance group three buildings. And these correspond roughly to uh, uh, risk category one and two buildings, risk category three buildings, and risk category four buildings. And then it shows the, uh, the types of earthquakes that we're designing for. And then on the horizontal scale shows the level of performance we expect out of those different buildings. So the idea is that if we have a relatively frequent earthquake, one that's common, maybe a, a 5.0 or 5.5 on the Richter scale for the California area, we would expect most buildings to survive that uh, unscathed. Maybe a relatively low risk building, like a risk category one building might have some damage to it, but we wouldn't expect essential facilities like hospitals and things of that nature to sustain much damage. On the other hand though, for a design level earthquake, we can expect uh, um, some damage to most buildings. Uh, risk category one and two buildings uh, are probably going to um, be damaged to the point where everybody inside is safe, but the structure might not be salvageable after the earthquake. The building might have to be destroyed and then reconstructed. But uh, if you look at a risk category four structure, like a hospital again, then it should still be open for business after a design level earthquake. Um, and then if you look at the, the performance under a maximum considered earthquake, just about everything is going to be demolished. Everything is going to collapse. Um, relatively common buildings like office buildings and things like that might actually collapse, resulting in a uh, loss of life. And uh, even uh, risk category four buildings like hospitals 
are going to sustain a lot of damage, but will presumably still be uh, able to sustain that without collapsing, though they might need to be demolished and reconstructed after, after uh, the dust settles, so to speak. Now, what we designed for is this middle group, uh, the design level earthquake. So recognize that if, quote unquote, the big one strikes California, that uh, you're not designing your building to sustain that level of earthquake. You're designing your building to, to sustain an earthquake that is approximately two thirds the maximum considered earthquake. Local site conditions can have a profound effect on the response of a structure to an earthquake. If you have a structure that's founded on rock or very dense soil, that's generally considered to be favorable. But if you have a structure that's founded on soft soils or uh, something like sand or clay, then that can amplify the accelerations that the structure feels during an earthquake. Based on the site soil properties, uh, each site shall be classified as either an A through F in accordance with chapter 20 of ASCE 7. And then the mapped accelerations are modified by the site coefficients F sub A and F sub V. And those equations are shown here. Table 20.3-1 out of uh, chapter 20 ASCE 7 gives us a table that we can use to determine the site classification based on uh, a few different parameters. You could either use the uh, velocity of a shear wave, V sub S, you can use the standard penetration number, or you could use the undrained shear strength S sub U. Um, in general, a site class A is the best, site class F is the worst. Um, so uh, if you're founding on something like rock, uh, then you're going to be in a class A or class B. If you're founding on something um, that's really soft clay or, or sand or something like that, it's going to be a class E or an F. Now, um, we'll keep it simple in this class. I'll probably give you the site classification or I'll give you uh, V sub S or S sub U directly and let you um, uh, look it up in this table. But uh, as an example, uh, if you use a standard cone penetrometer uh, and uh, hammer that into the soil, then the number of blows is uh, indicative of what type of, of soil you would have. So if you had a standard penetration number of N equals 25, for example, then that would just be correlated to a site class D. So the soils people can uh, dive into this more deeply, of course, and uh, you can uh, spend a lot of money on a, uh, a soil classification if you're not in something that is uh, a well-known soil. Okay, after you determine the, uh, the site classification, and once you know your mapped uh, spectral accelerations, you can use uh, table 11.4-1 and uh, another table to determine F sub A and F sub V. So site classification on the vertical axis, the uh, short period acceleration on the horizontal, and you basically just look up your value of F sub A from that. In a few rare uh, situations, you need to do a site-specific geotechnical investigation, and that can, uh, that can be time-consuming and costly. And then here's uh, table 11.4-2, which gives the uh, uh, site coefficient for the one second period, F sub V. And uh, basically it's, it's similar to what you saw for F sub A on the previous slide. So the importance factor for earthquakes is, uh, is something we've already covered uh, early in module number one. Um, but just as a, uh, uh, a reminder for that, we have an uh, importance factor I sub E for earthquakes that's uh, given as 1.0 if we have a risk category one or two structure, it's 1.25 for a risk category three structure, and it's 1.50 for a risk category four structure. So um, very loosely speaking, we're gonna design for ground accelerations that are 150% of uh, nominal uh, if we deal with a risk category four structure. And then as a reminder, here's our definitions of risk categories, and uh, I've boiled it down quite a bit for, for this relative to what we covered earlier in the semester. Um, but basically the default is a risk category two. Uh, risk category four structures are essential facilities and uh, risk category one structures are structures that are relatively low risk uh, to human life uh, in the event of a failure. Interesting side note, um, I attended a couple of lectures on earthquake uh, readiness when I was a graduate student, and they talk a lot about uh, 
non-structural issues associated with with um, uh, earthquake uh, hazard um, um, mitigation. And uh, a couple of things that I took away from that was the fact that when you get into seismic zones, uh, non-structural issues can become um, structural issues in a hurry. So one thing was uh, having to make sure that uh, things like hot water tanks uh, and furnaces are secured so that they don't topple over during an earthquake. If you have a gas hot water heater or a gas furnace and it moves around and becomes uh, dislodged, it could lead to a fire hazard, which could uh, lead to a structural issue in uh, a high rise building. Um, another thing is uh, with firehouses, a lot of, uh, a lot of fire uh, stations in seismic zones have automatic systems that will detect an earthquake and automatically open up the doors uh, in the event of a, a seismic event, in the event of an earthquake. Because in the past, they've had situations where a, uh, an earthquake would cause the overhead doors to be at jammed, and then they couldn't get the fire trucks out of the fire stations to go fight fires that resulted as a uh, uh, consequence of the, uh, the earthquake. So uh, kind of interesting. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a whole lot of non-structural issues associated with being ready for earthquakes. Anyways, that's a different topic. The last issue that we'll deal with in this presentation is that of seismic design categories. ASCE 7 section 11.6 says that all structures shall be assigned a seismic design category. And the design categories uh, range from A through F with A being the best and F being the worst. Uh, and then there's three bullet items here. Um, the first says that uh, risk category one, two, or three structures where S sub one is greater than or equal to 0.75 are designed a seismic design category E. Second bullet says that risk category four structures where S sub one is greater than or equal to 0.75 are designated a seismic design category F. And then finally, all other structures are assigned their SDC based on the occupa occupancy category and the spectral accelerations S sub DS and S sub D1 based on the tables that you'll see on the next two slides. The first of the two tables relates the seismic design category to the design value of the short period acceleration S sub DS and the risk category of the structure that's being considered. So you enter this table with your value of S sub DS and the risk category assigned to the structure, and you look up the uh, seismic design category for the structure. And this is the second of the two tables that you use to find the seismic design category. This table is based on the one second acceleration S sub D1 and the risk category for your structure. So the process is that you look up the seismic design category based on table 11.6-1 and then look it up again based on 11.6-2 and whichever one is more critical um, is the one that governs for your structure. So if you find a value of S sub D, S, the seismic design category is a category B based on table 11.6.1 but it's a category D for 11.6-2, then the category D would govern. Seismic design categories are used to address issues that are non-scalable. Um, if the ground acceleration changes a little bit from one point to another, then that scales up and we end up with larger forces. But other issues like when seismic anchorage is required, when particular inspections might be needed, which types of systems are permitted and how high can those systems be, which types of analyses are permitted, those are binary types of issues. And um, some of these are, are triggered when you get into certain seismic design categories. For example, um, if you're in a seismic design category A, then the requirements aren't very stringent. Uh, just about any type of analysis can be uh, performed, for example. But if you're in a seismic design category D, or even an E or an F, for example, then you're going to have to do an advanced type of analysis, and it's the seismic design category that dictates when those analyses are required. Seismic design categories are similar in nature to the seismic zones that were found in earlier versions of codes, but uh, the seismic design categories are a function of the risk category for the structure, whereas the old seismic zones were not. Seismic design categories can be loosely mapped to earthquake intensity. The commentary to ASCE 7 provides this mapping where an, an SDCA 
building is one where we don't really expect any damage. So that's going to be some place where the, the, the ground accelerations are really small. Um, an SDCB building, for example, is going to be uh, an intensity uh, six earthquake, light structural damage. An SDCE, though, is going to be up in the uh, nine range where we would expect damage to even robust structures. Okay, to summarize, the process for defining the design response spectrum starts off with determining what the mapped accelerations are for the building location. We find S sub S and S sub 1 from maps or type in an address or a zip code or lat and long coordinates into a web page and you get these values. The second step is to account for local site conditions by uh, determining the coefficients F sub A and F sub V. Again, the subscripts A and V correspond to the short period accelerations where the acceleration of the ground is important. Uh, and the subscript V corresponds to the one second accelerations for buildings with longer periods where the velocity of the ground movement is more important. Uh, and the third step is to determine the design accelerations by multiplying by the factor of two thirds which basically converts from ground accelerations that correspond to a maximum considered earthquake to ground accelerations that correspond to our design basis earthquake. Okay, after that, you assign a seismic design category for the structure based on the design accelerations and the risk category for the building or the structure. And then finally, you move on to the next step, which is to determine the base shear and the vertical distribution of forces that the structure is designed for. That last step will be discussed in the next presentation. Okay, after watching this video, you should have an understanding of how an earthquake affects a building in general terms. Uh, the ground shakes, it uh, causes an acceleration uh, at the base of the structure, which manifests itself as an inertial force or a series of inertial forces at the centers of masses of the, uh, the building. Um, different conditions affect the uh, impact of this earthquake on the structure in different ways. For example, a higher ground acceleration leads to higher forces. Uh, poor site conditions lead to higher felt forces um, and the risk category also influences the level of forces that we design for. In the next presentation, we'll discuss how to actually calculate the base shear and how to move on and calculate the forces that are applied at the story levels, at the floor levels, and the roof level within our structure. Thanks.